More opposition MPs are calling for Liberal Cabinet Minister Randy Boissonneau to resign. They're accusing Boissonneau of lying about his background and his business dealings. Today, question period descended into disorder when Conservative House Leader Andrew Scheer actually called Boissonneau a liar and the Speaker asked Scheer to withdraw. I'll withdraw the word lying and replace it with telling falsehoods. Yes. The, act, the actual word. The, um, the, the, the word which was being used. The word fake? But the minister did. He faked all those things. The, the, the minister is now not, uh, admitting that he's not indigenous, so he, he pretended faked. to be something that he was. The. It's, I will uh, withdraw the word fake and replace it with either sham, uh, imitation, uh, counterfeit. The Honourable. A lot to unpack today. The CBC's Kate McKenna joins us now from Ottawa to help us with that. Kate, that wasn't the end of the drama inside of the House of Commons. What is the latest? No, uh, but that was certainly indicative of what question period was like. And of course, it culminated in three Conservative MPs being ejected from the chamber over comments that were deemed unparliamentary by the Speaker. But at the centre of this are allegations that have been made, uh, levied at Employment Minister Randy Boissonneau. And today we saw both Conservative and NDP MPs calling for Boissonneau's resignation. Uh, there have been a number of allegations, but perhaps the key one in this context is that his former business Global Health Imports uh, applied for glo uh, applied for federal contracts claiming to be Indigenous owned. It's not. Boissonneau has said that his former business partner was working unilaterally. Uh, but here is what some MPs said today. To be frank, uh, it's unacceptable to have a fraud, uh, a fraudster in the federal cabinet. And uh, that's what Justin Trudeau is allowing to happen. Randy Boissonneau needs to resign. Randy Boissonneau must resign. If he does not resign, it is incumbent upon the Prime Minister to kick someone like that out. So that's sort of indicative of the conversation that was had on the Hill today, Catherine. We heard words like fraud, like liar, uh, like sham uh, in describing uh, Randy Boissonneau and, and his business dealings and how, what he's described about his family history. And of course, this is just one allegation uh, of several uh, that have been levied, most notably by the National Post, which has been a leader on this file. Uh, today, for instance, they published a story that we've been able to corroborate uh, about what Randy Boissonneau has said in the past about uh, his great-grandmother. Previously, he had said that she was a full-blooded Cree woman. Um, now, we've, we've, found, we've found some census records that indicate that she was at least partially German. Now, we do know that last week, Randy Boissonneau apologized for misrepresenting his Indigenous roots, but this comes in a greater context of those contracts that I mentioned and also other questions about whether or not he continued to uh, be involved in his uh, business, which was a medical supplies business, after he joined Cabinet it, which of course would be illegal. Randy Boissonneau has issued basically a blanket denial on all of these things, saying in multiple cases his former business uh, uh, partner, uh, Stephen Anderson, uh, was working in his best interests and, and not uh, telling the truth or, or not uh, telling uh, Randy Boissonneau what he was doing at the time. Uh, but certainly at this point, he and the Prime Minister and the Liberal branch are facing a lot of pressure from the Conservatives and the NDP uh, to remove Randy Boissonneau from Cabinet. Well, and now some of that pressure, Kate, is coming from outside of Parliament Hill. I spoke earlier uh, to AFN Regional Chief for New Brunswick for her reaction uh, to the Randy Boissonneau controversy. Have a listen to some of what she had to say. I think ignorance is not an excuse. I believe he he is the... he's claiming to be an Indigenous company. So if somebody's doing something on his behalf, he should have been aware. So I, I think ignorance is not an excuse and he should resign. And we will have that full interview next hour. Uh, Kate, tell us what happens next here. Well, one of the big questions is, is he going to remain in cabinet? I, we've heard from a few cabinet ministers over the past couple of days who offered very much lukewarm uh, support uh, for Randy Boissonneau. Several of them, including Minister Haidu today of Indigenous Services, saying it's up to him to defend his allegations and certainly that anybody claiming to be Indigenous when they're not is very harmful uh, to uh, Indigenous people. Yesterday, we heard Minister Duclos also kind of using that line that 
it's up to Randy Boissonneau to defend himself. And uh, earlier today, this morning, we heard from the prime minister, and his support was also rather lukewarm. Minister Boissonneau has uh, addressed these and will continue to answer directly for those. Uh, in the meantime, I'm happy that he is uh, continuing to lead on, on, uh, uh, on issues around jobs and employment uh, and uh, uh, represent Alberta in our government. Now, Catherine, we do know that a cabinet shuffle probably will happen, is set to happen uh, between now and the next election. Uh, the question is, will Randy Boissonneau be dropped from cabinet? Uh, there are considerations at play here. We know that he's one of only two MPs, two Liberal MPs, uh, that represent uh, Alberta in the Liberal caucus. Uh, so there could be some regional repercussions there, but certainly a lot of pressure from the Conservatives, the NDP, and as you mentioned, uh, some First Nations leaders uh, to do something about this. Okay. The CBC's Kate McKenna, thank you for bringing us up to speed. With the growing list of concerns, can Randy Boissonneau remain in Cabinet? Let's bring in the power panel to talk about it. Kate Harrison is a Conservative political analyst. Françoise Boivet is a former NDP MP. And here with me in studio, Michelle Cadario is a former Liberal National Campaign Director. And Sherelle Evelyn is the Managing Director of The Hill Times. Welcome, everyone. Uh, Michelle, I'm going to start with you. We should say Randy Boissonneau has refuted uh, so many of these stories laid the blame at the feet of his former business partner. He's no longer involved in the business. But the stories keep coming. He did apologize, as we said, for um, a lack of clarity around his background. Can he stay? Well, you know, I think that uh, it's clearly pro problematic. And uh, I'm not sure that you heard a uh, full-throated uh, absolute from um, whether it be the prime minister or any of his colleagues. Um, I expect that caucus will um, have uh, this will be a subject there when they talks tomorrow. Um, and, you know, irregardless of the, the facts of the issue, and I, I believe Randy and what he's saying, uh, I think that the real issue becomes it's a distraction for the government. And it's a distraction for uh, any kind of a legislation, which obviously is whole other issue, but any other kind of, of policy agenda that the Liberals want to bring forward, um, instead it's wrapped up in this. And uh, I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of people with a lot of questions, um, including I, I see some Indigenous leaders coming forward. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it's going to um, probably mean more than just a, 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 a simple apology uh, in terms of answering these. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think I recognize it's a very hard time, I'm sure, for him right now. Mm -hmm. um, and, but uh, I think that there's um, probably nothing is definitive right now either. Kate, uh, Stephen Harper did not like to fire cabinet ministers. And Randy Boissonneau has said time and time again, you know, maybe he went into business with somebody that he now regrets going into business with. But... Uh, he he has denied crossing any lines. Politically, what is the right move for the Liberals now? Yeah, there seems to be a lot of things that Randy Boisineau was not aware of uh, that are really some things that he should have been aware of. Um, he has leaned into Indigenous ancestry in the past, so to come out and say, you know, he's not as clear as he should have been, uh, perhaps he should have been more clear uh, in the years previous when he was making reference to that ancestry. Uh, I think it's very apparent that he cannot stay. Um, it is a distraction for the government, as Michelle says. It's also a distraction uh, to fulfilling his mandate, uh, responsible for employment and skills development. We have stagnant unemployment in this country. I can't imagine that he is giving that the full time and attention that it deserves the longer that this personal scandal occupies his time. And, and I do want to make the point, Catherine, this is a little bit more sinister than just a PR or a communications problem for the Liberals. You have Indigenous women mm. uh, speaking out and saying that Randy Boisonneau is a fraud. Michelle Rumpel-Garner and a number of her colleagues were silenced in the House today for simply just quoting the words of Indigenous women saying that Randy Boisonneau needs to account uh, for his false claims. Uh, that is undermining, in my view, reconciliation. And for a government that speaks so vociferously about the importance of that, they should be listening uh, to Indigenous peoples uh, well, who are it, saying that this is a problem. I, I, well, I'm going to let you get in here in a second, Michelle. I just want to be clear, uh, Kate, whether you're suggesting that the Speaker is undermining 
reconciliation by making judgments about what words are appropriate in the House of Commons. Yes, I am saying that he is undermining reconciliation by silencing members of caucus who were quoting Indigenous peoples who have taken issues with Randy Boisineau's false claims of Indigenous ancestry. I mean, I believe when it... Well, okay, Michelle, get he in. He accepted in the quote. Like, let's be clear. What he was not accepting was other language that is clearly unparliamentary, which, you know, Mr. Scheer, for example, recognized and actually withdrew. So it wasn't about quoting other people, particularly an Indigenous woman, in any way. It was for other language. And so we just got to be clear about why why action was taken and why it wasn't. Okay. I, I want to stay focused on this question about uh, reconciliation and some of the response we're seeing from a few, uh, a, a few Indigenous people. And, Francoise, I want to ask you about this. I mean, when the Prime Minister said this morning, I'm happy Randy Boissonneau's doing his job, I'm glad he's representing Alberta, we hadn't heard from Jody Wilson-Raybould, who, let's be fair... No fan of the prime ministers or many of yeah, his choices sure. these days. Um, you know, we have had this conversation earlier in the show with an AFN regional chief who says he has to go. What kind of position is the prime minister now in um, when we start to hear prominent indigenous voices saying this can't be tolerated? Well, that might uh, complicate his life a, a, a tiny bit. That's why I felt that uh, to the question uh, uh, concerning Randy Boissonneau, he was not... Uh, it made me sound of a hockey co coach uh, or a owner of a team saying, oh, I have confidence on my coach, and then the next day fires him. So I didn't feel like it was a, a total endorsement of, uh, of his minister, because when you say, you know what, he's going to deal with those questions in the House... And in a sense, I had that feeling that the prime minister was kind of happy with the diversion, except now the diversion is taking another turn because I also heard, uh, I think it's Blake de Jarlet, I might, mm -hmm. I, I'm sorry if I didn't say the name correctly, but his, his, his comments before uh, QP were, uh, I felt, I felt it. I'm not an indigenous person. I'm not a first nation person. So I, now I'm starting to understand the scope of 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 these type of uh, of claims that certain people do and and the in windows and so on. So for a prime minister who always said that he was there for First Nations, there for the reconciliation, it changes the ball game. And then maybe the fact that Randy Boissonneau is from Alberta, we love to have a minister from Alberta. Uh, it might be less way, uh, weight in 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 the balance. But to say that it's infringing on the policy, distracting from policy uh, agenda. I'm sorry, with my, with my friends there, I disagree. There's nothing happening. It's frozen, guys. So any distraction might be a good distraction. That, that, does, that, that might be what we call damning with faint praise, I think, for also us. Um, but, but there are very, obviously, various serious issues here at play. Oh, and I want uh, people to understand some of these these comments that we're hearing. So I referenced those comments by the AFN Regional Chief for New Brunswick, Joanna Bernard. We're going to be playing the full interview later in the show, talking about uh, broader issues that the government is facing around Indigenous procurement. But here is what she had to say when I asked her about Randy Boissonneau. I think ignorance is not an excuse. I believe he he is the... he's claiming to be an Indigenous company. So if somebody's doing something on his behalf, he should have been aware. So I, I think ignorance is not an excuse, and he should resign. Now, I should say, Shirelle, um, he says he never made that claim, right? Uh, he says it is his business partner that did this on his behalf, which uh, the regional chief was acknowledging there. But we, should, there, there, we haven't seen evidence that Randy Boissonneau made this claim on behalf of the business. What I want to talk to you about, though, is again, the position the prime minister's in. What you thought about the language that he used today um, as he offered an endorsement of Randy Boissonneau and what else he might be weighing, particularly when it comes to representation from Alberta. Well, okay, we'll start with the representation from Alberta piece because there isn't a lot to choose from when it comes to people that the prime minister mm -hmm. can have as a cabinet minister from Alberta. Um, not to say that, you know, Randy Boissonneau would not have been his uh, Prime Minister Trudeau's 
pick mm -hmm. as a, you know the Alberta person yeah. back in uh, 2021. Mm -hmm. um, but coming out of that election, you had Renny Boissonneau and you had George Chahal, yeah. who was under a whole lot of scrutiny because he had been caught on camera removing an opponent's uh, campaign materials from yeah. somebody's doorstop. He apologized for that. He got levied a fine, mm -hmm. and um, maybe they're hoping that at this point some of that you know uh, dust will have come off mm -hmm. and if they need to shuffle things around somebody might be you might be able to step in or you know there's always I'm sure there's I was gonna say there's a senator too but <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, can, that's a whole other a whole thorny other kettle thing. of fish yeah um, it's really difficult for what I was kind of hearing when I was kind of wondering is the way the language in which everybody is uh, talking about Randy Boston and mm -hmm. saying you know this is for him to answer for he will address this if they aren't kind of hoping that he's going to take himself out of the out of the running and mm -hmm. have him say you know what I'm being a too much of a distraction for the yeah. government right now. Let me step back from my role and and clear my name, so to speak, is what you usually hear mm -hmm. people say. And you know, everybody can else can get on with the business of the government. Um, I can't help but wonder if that's something that they kind of want to happen. Um, it is a difficult position for the prime minister to be in, though, to kind of let that just happen outside of his own hands because it as has been mentioned it's hard to have and say and say you have a really strong commitment to something like reconciliation when you let the guy with kind of re, who seemingly real questionable judgment versus based on all the things that we've seen come out about his company and his choice of business partners and all these things you let the white guy skate by and uh, every and everybody else kind of has to deal. Uh, Michelle, I wonder the, about the calculation um, being made in the Prime Minister's office if indeed a cabinet shuffle is in the offing. Because we know that there are several members of cabinet who are not reoffering. We would expect that at some point they're going to take those folks out of cabinet and put people who are going to be running in the next election, fresh new face. Maybe you talk about what's happening in the United States, Donald Trump. Look, this is our new team. Um, with everything going on with Randy Boissonneau, is there a case for keeping him if you're already making other changes to cabinet? I mean, I think of what happened with Marco Mendicino, frankly, where the prime minister continued to insist that he had faith in him, and then suddenly he was no longer a member of cabinet. Well, that's kind of how cabinet works, right? Yeah. Um, you have the uh, confidence of the prime minister until you don't. And uh, there's really only two people um, who are going to make this decision, uh, uh, Randy uh, Boissonneau himself, and, uh, and the Prime Minister, ultimately. Um, and uh, I do not believe for an instant that if they are, if they are going to have a big shuffle, and generally when you have an election coming, you, you do kind of shuffle out those who aren't running again, mm -hmm. um, that, uh, that whether Mr. Boisneau stays or goes is in any way um, an issue of that at all. Uh, I think that it really comes down to, does he have confidence that that Mr. Boisneau can continue to fulfill his duties as a minister of the crown, and that uh, and that is it in the best interest of his government um, that he stay. And if he chooses yes, then then ultimately Prime Minister's going to going to keep him. Um, but it's not going to have anything to do with timing or what else is happening at all. It is going to come down to those kind of factors. Can Mr. Boisneau clear up what is going on uh, sufficiently um, to uh, kind of answer some of the questions out there um, or not? Kate, tell me a bit about the political calculation that the Conservatives are making here. In so, like they, they have been talking about this for some time. The, obviously, I mean, for some time, gosh, months and months and months since I believe the first reporting from this came from, from Global News. Since those stories first emerged, they've been very focused on it. Obviously, the intensity has picked up. Um, political parties always need to make calculations. I mean, not a lot of folks are at home. Um, you know, folks are worried about their groceries and they're worried about the cost of, of living. Um, but they don't like things that don't smell good, even though, again, it's important to say Randy Boissonneau has, um, you know, denied wrongdoing here. What is the calculation that Conservatives are making focusing so much on this issue right now? Well, I think where there's smoke, there's fire. 
uh, we have seen this story evolve for months. First, there was the issues around, you know, financial impropriety, accessing government funding while being a minister. Uh, that's the claim that um, has been made about the, the company uh, that he was involved with. Um, he's now got uh, what I would describe as at least a shady business partner, perhaps several shady business partners, uh, including one that he, you know, there was a mailbox shared with somebody that's been accused of, of drug trafficking. Uh, and now we have the claims of uh, indigenous ancestry uh, that have been called into question. So uh, if you're wondering why the Conservatives are making such a big deal about this, uh, all of these things independently are big things to make a, a deal out of. Uh, and for a minister to be so occupied and embroiled in this degree of scandal, for things that are quite obviously, I think to most Canadians, conflicts of interest, uh, it is really questionable how the Prime Minister can continue to stand by him. Because I think Wazano's judgment is clear. It's clearly been wrong. He's blamed other Randys. He's blamed his business partners. He blamed everybody but himself uh, on all of these issues. But people should be asking about the judgment of the prime minister to stand by him for this long, uh, because it is ultimately his call, to Michelle's point, whether or not uh, Mr. Wazano remains in cabinet. And when you have all of this evidence, uh, as, as we do, uh, it's really uh, astounding that the Prime Minister wouldn't make such a clear call on this months ago when the questions around financial impropriety existed, let alone what we're learning just in these last few weeks. Joanna Bernard is the Assembly of First Nations Regional Chief for New Brunswick and holds its economic development portfolio. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Uh, we are going to look at this bigger question of the contracts in a moment, but I do want to ask you first, what are your thoughts about this specific case of Employment Minister Randy Boissonneau's former company having sought Indigenous status? Well, there is where the problem lies with self-identification self uh, when you uh, apply for any contract or when you identify uh, whether it's even... Uh, going to school or a school applications, you can self-identify and there is where lies the problem because uh, the prime minister himself could self-identify as indigenous. If you look at it, uh, it's, there's a problem there, right? And I don't know. Obviously, these questions about who gets to decide are complex, too. So I want to dig deeper into that in a moment. I do want to say, though, that um, Randy Boissonneau, of course, has denied all of these allegations, and he claims that this um, seeking this Indigenous status is something his former business partner did without his consent. Though, again, I, I want to stay with the question of him because there is this public discussion about his heritage right now. He had talked about his adopted family as being Cree. He now says... Uh, they are Métis. He says he apologizes for not being as clear as he could have been about his history. There's been new information. Some MPs have said what Minister Boissonneau uh, has said publicly is grounds for him to resign. What do you think? I think ignorance is not an excuse. I believe he he is the... He's claiming to be an Indigenous company. So if somebody's doing something on his behalf, he should have been aware. So I, I think ignorance is not an excuse and he should resign. So you, you believe that he should no longer be a minister of the Crown at this moment? You're calling for his resignation? Well, if that's the case on this one issue, then what are the other issues that may be out there in regards to how he conducts himself and his business? I will get to the, and I promise we are going to get to this bigger issue of contracts in a moment, but I want to ask you too, I mean, it's, it's not entirely his call, whether or not he resigns is, but of course, who is in cabinet is a question for the prime minister. So what would your message be to him at this moment? Well, uh, the issue about uh, Indigenous companies and indi people who are claiming to be Indigenous has been a problem for many, many, many years. Uh, the Métis uh, has a membership that uh, can go down 10 generations, whereas the First Nations uh, membership stops after the second generation. So we can no longer identify as it, as First Nations after the second generation. And the membership at, at the Métis uh, can, is allowed to go, there's no, no accountability. You just go in and say you're Métis and you become a member. So I think the membership list uh, for the Métis is over 600,000. That's because uh, there's no accountability or transparency. Whereas First Nations, we are, uh, uh, regulated through uh, the Indian uh, 
registry in Ottawa. So, and after second generations, we're not uh, no longer identified as First Nations. So those procurement uh, opportunities would not be available for our grandchildren. Whereas the Métis, uh, they could be 10 generations. And like I said, the prime minister himself could identify as, uh, as Métis. So l let's just be clear, at this moment, when it comes to this liberal procurement strategy specifically, and a business wanting to say that it's an Indigenous business, how, how hard is it? Is it just a question of ticking a box at this point, or is there a broader scrutiny? There is nothing in place at this point, and that's where lies the problem. Uh, we need accountability and transparency on these contracts to ensure that whoever is getting them are truly Métis and truly First Nations. Uh, there's also an issue with a lot of uh, companies coming and putting an Indigenous name. Some band member from anywhere can put their name on it, and then it's considered an uh, Aboriginal company. and. These are, we call them shell companies, right? So basically, it, there's a problem there. So there's still a lot of work to be done to ensure transparency and accountability by the government to ensure that this procurement benefits the Indigenous people uh, that are uh, that are okay. recognized. How, how, I mean, the Liberals say 6% of contracts going to Indigenous businesses. How widespread do you think it is? How, how, what percentage do you think actually has gone to Indigenous businesses? Well, the procurement strategy is not new. It's been out there for 20 years, if not longer. But, but the Liberals have tried to make improvements to it, is my understanding, in the past few years. Yes, well, the improvement is, is it's essential that we identify who is First Nations, because I worry that then everybody's going to claim uh, ancestry and become a Métis, and uh, then the true Indigenous companies will lose out on these opportunities and these benefits, which was essentially uh, put in place for them. So it's a huge concern, huge. Well, obviously, at the same time, it is very fraught for the government to start telling people whether or not they should be Indigenous. Indigenous Services Minister Patty Haidu said at committee today they want to transfer responsibility for deciding who should be on this Indigenous business registry to Indigenous groups, but there's not consensus amongst Indigenous groups about how that should work. What is your advice to government on making this process better, uh, more efficient, more, more honest by the sounds of it now? Well, um, in, in our First Nations, we have membership codes. We have a membership list that is within our communities and at the uh, federal level. So that list is very well um, uh, identified and transparent, whereas other organizations, their membership is not. So there's a need right there to work on uh, with the other uh Indigenous organizations to come to consensus because I believe that they know also that it's it's an open book over there for the Métis where the everyone under the sun is putting their name as Métis and uh, they feel that it's an issue too. I was just in Peru with the, uh, the president of the uh, Métis Council mm -hmm. and she also is hoping to sit down with the, the other Indigenous organizations in Canada to figure it out because it's a problem for them too. So We, uh, we, we only have a moment yeah. left and I, I would just like to know what you think the consequences should be if a company falsely claims to be Indigenous? It's hard to say falsely because they're allowed to do so. There's no accountability for it. Everybody can put their name as Métis, and that's the problem. So the, I don't know if the individuals who are claiming it, if they're allowed to do so, will do it. But who? how do you... Um, penalize or punish those that are falsely claiming when there is nothing in place to stop them from doing so. Well, certainly in some cases, people would know, right? Individuals, and I, I'm, not, I'm not referring to any specific case, but the suggestion is that some people know that they don't have any kind of connection. That's true. I mean, you could say your great-great-grandmother is Indigenous, uh, so... You know, I think the problem lies in the, the the government not taking that membership and really going through it with a fine tooth comb to find out 
who is actually supposed to be on that list because as you know uh the the indigenous women uh before 1985 lost their status so what they did that they went put their name on the metis list and then when the change came that, that they they got their rights back they became members of their community again but they're still on the old list so that list is essential that we go through that to find to ensure that this procurement strategy works for all Indigenous people, true Indigenous okay. people in Canada. Okay. Regional Chief, thank you very much for your time today. You're welcome.